Hey guys, Josh from the Ancient History Guy here. Hello and welcome to all. I hope you're all having a fantastic day. Anyways, today we are going to be talking about a Netflix series that has been called the most dangerous documentary ever made, Ancient Apocalypse. This is the latest instalment in Graham Hancock's quest to prove that an ancient civilization did exist before our own. This has garnered, let's say, some heated discussion, with many branding it as a dangerous, deliberate misinterpretation of history. There are going to be some spoilers ahead, but hey diddly ho, you have been warned, let's go. Right, so first off the bat, who the bloody hell is Graham Hancock? Well, to quote himself, he's a journalist specialising in history, so basically he's an amateur historian. Now, Hancock's whole gig is that he likes to challenge the preconceived notion of academically accepted history. Graham is looking for evidence of a lost civilization, specifically because he claims we, as humans, are a race with amnesia and we have forgotten something incredibly important about our past. This isn't exactly a bold statement, or to be honest, anything new. It's largely accepted that a majority of human history is lost to us, so I don't see the whole shebang behind his statement here. Anyways, sufficient to say he has characterised himself as a sort of lone voice crying out in the wilderness against the conformity of modern academia, and to be honest he does have some good points, but he also has a tendency to come across as a woe is me, nobody takes me seriously. Now just a quick word here, my area of expertise in ancient history is primarily focused around the classical world of ancient Rome and ancient Greece. However, lately I have been researching more and more into the time period covered in Ancient Apocalypse. That being said, a majority of my knowledge is limited to the Middle East, Western Mediterranean and a tiny weeny bit into the East. So as a result, my arguments are going to be mainly based around my knowledge of these areas. Let's start with a statement by Mr. Hancock which initially lured me into a false sense of security. He opens up his series by saying he's on the hunt for a lost ancient civilization something that I will continue to bring up by the way. He says he is specifically looking for one that coexisted with our own ancestors during the Ice Age. Now he mentions here how it's entirely possible for people at different stages of the technological tree to coexist together. This is entirely true, and here we are going to use my very limited knowledge of ancient Russia. You see, part of Russia is and was very very cold. As a result, the area and the people living there at the time didn't well industrialise all that much because the resources and the actual need wasn't there. This is in comparison to the people in Mongolia, China area which were already beginning to settle down and smelt bronze. Indeed, this area of the world seemed to lag behind most of the world. This was up until a majority of the people from the northern parts of Mongolia and China were forced out of their homes by the supposed ancestors of the Huns, the Zayong. These exiled people brought technology with them and so introduced bronze and metalworking into the area. That being said, not everything Hancock says about Ice Age civilizations and their people is, well, accurate. Now that that little bit of praise is out of the way, let's look at pyramids. Now pyramids, let's face it, are bloody awesome. However, I feel like Hancock missed the mark a little bit here, divulging just how bloody cool the fact is that every continent on Earth seems to have pyramids. First off, let's look at what a pyramid is. Well, it's a big man-made structure, usually built with bricks, that stretches up into the sky and we all have absolutely no freaking clue how on Earth the ancients did it. As well as that, there are some cool astrological features which baffle modern scientists because how could ancient humans possibly do advanced calculations without a computer? Mm? I have a whole theory on pyramids which I'll go into in a later video, but for now, here is a nice little logical explanation for pyramids being absolutely everywhere. There is a simple and fairly logical reason as to why everywhere has pyramids, and that's because they are simply the easiest tool structure to build. The wider the base, the more weight it can hold, so the larger the building. This makes sense when you are trying to build the coolest thing possible to make your god of choice think you are awesome, and show favour towards you. The larger your completed building is, the cooler you look. There is also the vanity of, ooh, look at me, I built the tallest thing in the area, <clears throat> Tower of Babel, <clears throat> oh, pardon me, uh, which is meant to inspire awe and wonder to keep everyone in line. I'm leaning more towards the side of these being constructed to honour and show off to the gods and everyone, rather than some mystical person arriving teaching people how to build stuff. 
which is something that Hancock claims happened. He thinks that these bearded figures emerged from the sea and then taught the very basic human cavemen how to build their civilizations. Now, this is where I start to take a lot of issues with the series. For one, Hancock seems to constantly reinforce the idea that cavemen dumb, cavemen not make building, cavemen need smart man to show him how to make building and not be stupid. Cavemen were not dumb, they were fitter, stronger and probably able to store a heck of a lot more information in their heads than we can today. For example, let's look at stones. Rocks are well abundant, but I bet you, right now, if you went out to your local rocky place and tried to pick a stone that you could easily shape for hunting, but that would also be sturdy enough that it wouldn't break on impact, you would be lost without a clue in the world. Also, what stones would you use to sharpen it? You would have to get a stronger stone to do that, but which stone? Also, which stone would you use to make a fire? Where would you get said stone? Why does some stone have a shiny bit inside? I don't know, let's make a mental note of that because it's kind of cool. Simply put, these stone men were not dumb animals. They were extremely intelligent, learning off one another and able to make and invent stuff on the whim. They were also able to, funnily enough, build houses out of whatever was lying around. Mammoth tusks were highly sought after as they could be transported during winter and used as makeshift shelters. You know, to make a warm place to shelter from the bloody cold. Talking of stones, let's talk about Gobikale Tepe. Yes, impressive monument. Very, very cool. Top notch eye candy for historians and archaeologists. Wow, look at those stone pillars. Aren't they cool? Must have used some advanced techniques to make them. To quote the man himself, he says, You can't just wake up one morning with no prior skills, no prior knowledge, no background in working with stone, and create something like Gobekli Tepe. Now here's the thing. The thing is made out of limestone. Here's a quote. Limestone is usually grey, but it can also be white, yellow or brown. It is a soft rock and is easily scratched. I think personally that a society who knows which stones are perfect for carving other harder stones will know exactly what stones to look for to easily carve massive monoliths, don't you? Hmm. As for how the stones got there, well, that's not mentioned because I'm guessing even our Lord History Saviour can't think of that would imply that these humans that built this monument would have to have an idea about how to do something that requires thinking. Turns out that the stone used in this construction was actually sourced locally, if not right on the spot, meaning all the people had to do was find a fault line, smack a big old chisel into it, separate it from the rock and then lever it into place with logs. Easy peasy in theory. Now we know this because there are several cases nearby where people building Gobekli Tepe tried to lift the limestone and then broke it, leaving it behind in frustration. Now, let's talk about the stars. Hancock uses a nifty little app to travel back in time to see what the stars were like thousands of years ago, which is cool. But anyways, this app was introduced to us by a Maltese historian who has gone on to say that what she says in the show has been heavily edited and it's nothing like what she actually said. Hancock goes on this nice little tangent here, which conveniently misdirects us away from the quest of finding a lost civilization to one of a natural disaster, as now the stars are foretelling us that there was a massive disaster 10,000 years ago. Now, in my opinion, stars are pretty cool, don't you think? You know how you can draw shapes and whatnot, kind of like magic, aren't they? Totally thought Orion's belt was a horse as a kid. Oh, oh, so look at all these cool paintings of constellations. Humans are artists, however, they are also somewhat lacking in originality when it comes to art. Simply put, as a rule, we like to draw and paint cool looking things. Yes, sometimes those things can be laid with meanings and metaphors, but a majority of the time we are carving slash painting it because we think it looks cool. Look at modern churches, we have a freaking xenomorph on one of them. Imagine what future archaeologists are going to think when they find that, that's going to really throw a freaking spanner in the works, isn't it? The point is that yes, these animals that are on Gobikli Tepe could be constellations, however I can't help but notice that in the actual graphics used to prove that the stars are meant to align with the position of the stars at a certain date, have been stretched, morphed and also bumped up slightly to better fit. So in theory this could be done to absolutely anything. It does nothing other than introduce us to your theory, which is cool don't get me wrong, but also doesn't prove anything like at all. Hancock then goes on to say how Gobekli Tepe and the temples in Malta are aligned to the star Sirius. 
Well, turns out the maths doesn't add up. Most of the enclosures at Gobekli Tepe are at least 100 years older than when the proposed alignment took place, with enclosure C being way, way out there. According to astrological data, this enclosure should have been built around 8850 BC to align with the dog star. But according to radiocarbon dating, it was built in between 9261 and 9139 BC. By the way, big thanks to Ancient Architects for making a video on this, it has come in real handy. Also, it turns out Gobekli Tepe had a roof, so you wouldn't have been able to see the stars anyway. Also, Sirius wouldn't have been as bright as it is today, due to the fact that the atmosphere and its position in the night sky would have actually dimmed it. Quote, the biggest drawback with Sirius's use as a stellar target so soon after its reappearance is that it would have been barely visible to the naked eye, its usual bright magnitude diminished due to atmospheric extinction. So to summarise, not only is Gobekli Tepe not pointing at Sirius, the star also would not have been visible. Now let's talk about snakes. Snakes play a heavy part towards the end of the series, you know, when Hancock has completely lost all direction from his mission statement of finding a lost civilization and instead starts focusing on a so-called ancient apocalypse. Now, Hancock says that the snakes represented on all the pyramids and religious sites he's visited are referenced to a comet. This is plausible as you know, comets do sort of stretch across the night sky, a bit like a snake. In the real world, snakes are, well, pretty darn deadly. In fact, their venom is unique because it can kill things so quickly. As a result, snakes are largely seen as being extremely powerful things for their size. I mean, you don't even have to look all the way back into the past. Humans today freak out when they see a snake, for fear of being bitten by one. In fact, all over Gobekli Tepe, we see snakes doing just that, biting things, killing things, and then eating things. Gobekli Tepe, and most of the other places mentioned throughout Ancient Apocalypse, inspire awe, and what inspires more awe than fear? Simply put, the snake decorations just add a bit of amazement to the construction, a bit like how we have gargoyles on modern day churches. This leads me on to what I find the most annoying thing about this series. Hancock opens almost every episode with the statement he's on a quest for a lost civilization. Which is cool, you know, good hook, but I feel like as the series progresses, specifically towards the tail end, he kind of loses track of that original mission statement and instead starts focusing on what might be the origin of the Great Flood myth. Now don't get me wrong, this is absolutely a fascinating period and it's also one that I personally don't entirely agree with modern scholars and academia about. So, fair warning, I am going to express my own opinions. Now, most seem to think that the Great Flood, you know, the one involving Noah and his rather oversized canoe, was the result of dunes blocking a river and then flooding a small river valley. I believe the overarching idea is that a similar thing happened to all proto-civilizations because, well, they all set up shop next to the rivers, didn't they? And rivers tend to, you know, flood when it chucks it down. That's the academic and scholarly version of the tale. Me personally, I prefer the melting ice cap theory, specifically the Holocene Glacial Retreat, compared to Hancock's preferred Younger Dryers event. The Holocene Glacial Retreat seems to have drastically affected the entire world, most noticeably the Persian Gulf, which had been up until this point above water. Fun fact, this is still going on today, with fragments of the Larsen B ice shell still lingering on until as recent as 2005. Anyways, this started happening around 19,000 years ago and began speeding up 4,000 years later. In my mind, this explains why everyone has roughly the same myth happening at the same time. This flood also affected everywhere, whilst the Younger Dryers event seems to have been a fairly localised affair. I even read somewhere that bits of North America were basically untouched by the event. This was simply put a much larger and more devastating flood, happening as humans were beginning to farm and settle down, especially in the Persian Gulf, where the lands along the coast were particularly fertile. Now, I'm not saying that this isn't a cool thing to talk about. It is. Just look at the tangent I just went on. But at the same time, you start every episode with, I am looking for a lost civilization. And then you don't actually find the lost civilization, you just find a link between all the other civilizations, which I'm not being funny. Anybody who has read a little bit of ancient history knows about. Everywhere has pyramids, everywhere has a flood myth. Wow, coincidence. I feel like the showrunners realised this in the editing room and quickly changed the name of the series to Ancient Apocalypse to better suit the story that Hancock is trying to tell. 
So, fair play, not exactly misleading the audience there, but maybe start your episodes with something like, Did a big flood kill a lots of people? Hmm? I found it a little annoying as the series went on, so what is this actual apocalypse Hancock claims happened? Hancock claims that the Younger Dryas period, a period which plummeted the Earth back into Ice Age conditions, was started by a comet bombarding the ice cap, flooding everything and causing mass destruction. He claims there is no evidence of this comet impact because it hit the ice cap, so naturally the crater sort of melted away. This is all well and good, however, the evidence they present, the so-called dark line of destruction, is, well, exaggerated. Problem is, out of all the other sites that they claim to have found, this dark line, only three actually date to the supposed time. Quote, as is, only three of all 29 sites offered in support of the YDIH apparently date to the YD onset. However, two of these are problematic. At Big Eddy and Sheridan Cave, the supposed YD B layer has the required age, but its age is inconsistent with the ages of the layers that encompass it. The third site, Daisy Cave, seems to have been dropped from the corpus of evidence since being published. Now, that's not really looking all that good for the whole widespread comet theory now, is it? Hmm? Talking about the ice caps, this is where I like to say something positive about the series. Most episodes start with Hancock visiting some remote island somewhere in the world. I mean, I guess you can get away with calling Malta remote, right? But anyways, one thing I love about this series is the fact that they go to the effort to explain that the coastlines of the world were completely different than they are today. Honestly, it baffles me why more timeline accurate coastlines are not used in most academic studies. Classic example here, England during the Saxon era did not look like it looks today, but rather had a lot of wetland, so the coast and the shape of the country looked completely different. We go through warm and cold spells all the time. Rivers form and then they evaporate, and for a short time they play an extremely important part in the history of that specific area. So for that, well done Hancock, you earn one point from me. Now, I feel I should probably end this little review here, so what do I think of this series? Well, I think that it has some positives and it also has some very glaring negatives. I think there is an awful lot of bending the facts here, and a lot of skimming over certain details. At the same time, there are some aspects to the series that I like, the focus on historically accurate coastlines, which I love, and the idea that the Great Flood myth was caused by ice caps. As well as this, I like the inclusion of the fact that different level civilizations can live alongside each other, as exemplified in Russia around the Neolithic. Is it going to encourage more people to do their own research and discover more about history? Of course. Does this series do damage and is it dangerous? Mm, yes and uh, no. It certainly appeals to the wow factor that seems to be taking everything by storm nowadays, whilst at the same time bending the facts to the point where they are basically being twisted to resemble something else. But at the same time, I think it's just going to sort of settle like the myth of Columbus's discovery of America has. People will gradually uncover what academia actually has researched, rather than basing their understanding on hearsay. Also, as a final closing note, it gets really, really tiring hearing how the mainstream media and academia are out to get Hancock because he's not, uh, you know, following their narrative. For Pete's sake, man, we all understand that theories exist. In fact, science is based on theories. But at the same time, if you are just bending the facts and completely and utterly disregarding stuff that did happen, you're kind of opening yourself up to be laughed at. Sorry, mate. Anyways, those are just my thoughts. What do you think? Let me know down in the comments below. Thank you for watching and listening to our videos. Be sure to like, comment and subscribe if you've enjoyed. All sources are listed and linked in the description below. I've been the Ancient History Guy, and as always, I'll be seeing you later.